Good morning. It's a new adventure, a new time. I just, we will see how it goes. I want to welcome those who are here, those who are online. Um, Pastor Herb asked me to preach a few weeks back, and I was going through some things, and he gave me a passage, and I said, can I preach a passage that I have been hiding in for a while? And he said, go ahead. So let us pray. Father, we thank you. You are an awesome, gracious, all-powerful, all-caring, all-loving God, and we often forget those traits. This morning, will you continue to prepare us as your ambassadors, uh, your lighthouses into a dark world that needs to see light? I would pray as we leave here, you have helped us reorder our life and our priorities that two things happen. One, we grow in you, and two, we reveal you to our world around us in a more active way, that they too might see the light of the risen Savior. And we thank you for those opportunities. We thank you for the day. We thank you for giving us another day in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. I want to talk about a game plan. Every one of you have a game plan. You had a game plan when you got up this morning to come to church. You may also have a game plan for the afternoon, and it may be all filled, and maybe tomorrow. But oftentimes, the question really is, our game plan God's game plan? Are we going where God Is this going in and out? Or... Okay. Me, because I'm turning? Okay, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. What if we go to plan B? We'll go to plan B? Okay, we're on plan B, which now is God's plan A. <laughs> and that's life, isn't it? That's, that's really life. Um, so I want to talk about, first of all, if you know Jesus Christ, there's one thing you know right now. You're going to be in heaven, and nothing is going to stop that. Amen? Because you need to remember that sometimes, because sometimes life gets so bad and so dark, you wonder, am I ever going to make it? Do you ever ask yourself that question? Am I ever going to make it to the finish line? And then two is how am I walking towards that finish line? What am I allowing God to do in my life today that's going to make my life different tomorrow and the next day and the next day as I shine my light in my world? You have those two things in your game plan, you're going to change your world. Pastor Herb says he wants to what? He wants to change the picture on the, in, in the Northwest about Jesus. We have right now 150-some lights right here, and I don't know how many others are online. You're going to go out today, and you're going to have 150 times maybe five different people you can shine lights on, and you can share with them. And see, if they can see what Jesus is doing in your life, and they can ask you, you can say, let me tell you what the Lord, or you can be like me. I was in the, <clears throat> um, the club, I go in the morning early. Uh, my body's old, so I go in this hot tub, I soak, I stretch out, and I feel like I can take on the world. And I'm always asking God, okay, who are you going to bring in my, and he brought this gentleman, and we started talking, he started talking about a struggle with weight. And he said, that's a hard battle. And he said, yes, it is. And I said, do you mind if I pray for you? And I prayed for him. I said, Lord, speak to him today. Let him see your hand. I haven't seen him. It's about a week. I'm looking forward to seeing. Because God opens those doors if we are prepared to see him open. And so that's why we're going to talk about this game plan, that each day we're praying in a way that we are prepared for the open doors that are going to come across us. And you don't have to tell him the whole story but you can tell them what God has done in your life. And oftentimes what God has done in your life, he's doing in others. The other day I had an opportunity, and I better shut up or I'll never get the message here. I was praying for somebody that was struggling with anger. And I said, can I pray for you? And then I said, you know something? My wife and I were walking through this battle with cancer, and she was dying. 
and the church has been praying and everything was going great. And one day, and I don't even know what happened, I came home from church, not from uh, Cancer Carolines, and I was angry. I mean, I don't get angry very much anymore. I used to be very angry. But I, I was angry enough, I was looking for somebody to boom on. And it was the wrong place because I'm home. You know, but isn't that where we sometimes let it all out because no one's going to see it? The wrong place we do it. But I knew I was angry, and I called up a buddy that prays with me. I'm on a, a t we, we get together weekly to pray and disciple each other. And I said, Tom, you need to pray for me. I said, if I was a general in the Army, I'd have the whole battalion dressed in battle fatigues and on a five-mile march in the middle of the night, not being able to ask any questions. And then when they get back, I'm not going to say anything. But you know what, Tom? I'm still going to be angry. Pray for me. And he said, I will, and he did. And I, that was maybe five at night, six at night, I don't know. And about a half hour later, I'm starting to sing. And I said, God, it's gone. It's gone. God wants to hear and answer and provide. And you're on a journey, and I'm on a journey, and God knows we're broken people. If you were asking if I'm an angry person, I'd, well, you better ask, I'd ask everybody else. You know, if it's self-evaluation, it's not a good evaluation. But I don't think I'm an angry But all of a sudden, it showed up, and I knew it was, shouldn't be there. And I knew those feelings were not God's feelings. And I knew God didn't want me feeling those feelings. And I couldn't do anything about it, but I said, I did what I needed to do. I let somebody else and God know. And see, that's why we need one another. That's why we need community, because it's not just up to us. It's up to us in our community, praying for one another. And so I'm just going to say thank you. You guys have prayed for us for, what, 22, 24 months, 22 on, 20 on a journey with cancer with Linda, and three months now on a journey by myself that is hard. I want to turn to Romans. Chapter 8. And all I'm doing here, very quickly, I'm going to read, and I'm going to say this is God's promise to us about victory. In Romans 8, 3, it says, For what the law was powerless to do, it was weak by sinful man. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering and so to condemn sin in sinful men. And in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. The aspect there is that when you and I accept Jesus Christ, Jesus' righteousness comes in. We're no more trying to get good enough for God. We are God's. We are his children, and we're going to get there. And then he goes down <clears throat> in a verse. Um, I've got these temporary glasses, so please forgive me. I'm trying to adjust where they're at. Verse um, 34. I'm going to look up here at the big type. It says, who is going to condemn? Well, who is a condemner in our world? It's the accuser, Satan. Romans says he accuses the brother day and night. Remember what he said about Job? Job loves you because you're good to him. And he's accusing us, and he has a good record. Do you realize? If, and he stands before God, and he's accusing us. Is there anything in your life he has that he can accuse you of before God right now? From last week. Just from last week. Some hiccups. Look what happens. He goes before God and he does that. And then the word says, Jesus Christ, who died more than that, who was led, uh, raised from the dead, and is at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. All this is written for your sake. We face death all day long, and we are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. That's looking at it from down here, from Satan's perspective. But no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons. Talk about worrying about demons. We were at, we were, you saw that picture about Union Gospel. We were down at Tent City Tuesday night, four of us. And, and one of these gentlemen was 
was trying to cope with his pain with some heroin. And he was being chased by demons. He felt he was being chased by demons. He saw people out there chasing him. There was nobody there. They were in here. The good news, see, demons can't get to you. That's what it says, doesn't it? They're not going to separate you from the other God. You may be pressured. You may have things stuck. But they're not going to take you and take you away. And he goes on, so no demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any other powers, neither the heights nor the depths nor anything else in all of creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ, in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have the victory. You can put that in your back pocket. You don't have to plan on that one. What you do need to plan on is how are you going to walk towards that victory? And God says, you know, Mark, it's not an easy walk. We wish it would be easy. How many of you would like to be able to have a Cadillac pick you up today and just shoot you off, get you in an airplane, fly where you want to go, do what you want to do? We all think that that would be the life. Why do people that have all that get addicted to drugs, commit suicide, get divorced? See, they're looking at the temporary, not the eternal. Listen to what God says about you and I. Therefore, in verse 4, first verse says, Therefore, through God, we have mercy. We may, this ministry that we do not, in this ministry, we do not lose heart. And then over in verse 4, it says, But we have this treasury in jars of clay to sell all surpassing power. It's from God, not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our bodies. And then he goes down to verse 15. All these are for your benefit. So the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. That far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. You build those into your life walk, and you'll have a game plan. See, God is in the business of all of us. See this beautiful clay vessel? It's pretty. We all like those kind of clay vessels. We want, all of us want people to see us as all together. We don't want them to see our broken parts, do we? When our broken parts are revealed, we, we withdraw because we think we're going to get rejected. What did this passage say? It said, so let your light shine. So there's my light. <laughs> God, God has put it in my heart so that people see, not me, but Jesus Christ. When you and I are willing to let people see our brokenness and then share how God's grace has changed my perspective and why I have hope, you have a platform to speak. There are people out there right now that want you to think there's this. But you know them and you know this. And when you can speak and share from your own perspective, you need to share your breaking points but how God changed them, you have a platform to share the grace of God to the glory of God and watch what God does. That's not for you to bring the change. That's for God. That's what God's doing in our lives, and we have to let him do that because life is hard. Would you say that the last year and a half has been dark in our world? Darker than it seemed to have ever been. Would you almost also say that as I look forward, it doesn't look any better? 
I know God's there. I know God's with me, but it doesn't look any better. And if we haven't got a good game plan, we don't respond the right way. Some of us are frustrated with what's going on with government. Some of us are frustrated with what's going on locally. And sometimes anger can grab hold of us. And we can say things we shouldn't say. Because we don't understand what God is doing. And we don't see God. And I want to share... I've known the Lord now for mm, 56 years, and he's done a great job. My wife, you know, my wife says, if I knew you before we got married, about your background, I never would have married you. And I used to quip back to her, you knew I was saved with a prison rescue team. That ought to say it all. <laughs> and, and God's done a great work, but he's, all I'm just saying, he's still in process. These last two years, God has taken my wife and I and taught us a whole new way of walking together. Now, we were walking together, and God was blessing, but it wasn't the blessing just of that. It was you guys praying for us, and, and, but we learned every day to treat every day as the last day. See, when somebody tells you you got five to eight months, that changes your whole perspective. October of 2020... We had an individual come to our house. We took an evaluation. We planned how we could sell the house. We could invest it, and Linda would be, and I could be taken care of until we're 98. And I was going to take the rest of that, and I didn't know where God was going to take me. I called Pastor Herb up. I said, Pastor Herb, I think my time here is over, and, it's, and I'm not leaving because of you. I'm glad you're here. I think you're going to do a great job. I just think there's something more that God wants to do. And two weeks later, God gave us his evaluation of that decision. He says, you're going nowhere. Linda came out. She said, the doctor just called. We've got to go to emergency. My liver's failing. We got in the car. And and the thing I'm struggling with, which God taught me on this these two years, is I am I'm a firstborn. I'm a charger. I'm a doer. I, if there's a problem, I'm jumping into it, and we're going to fix it. Now, there's a lot, you may evaluate how I fix it, but I'll get it done. Uh, I am not a good person to build a church because church takes time. I can do things, and people say, how do you get that done? I don't know. Everybody, we just got it done. There are other people that build boom, 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 and they know how it gets done, and they can turn it over to somebody. That's not me. But anyway, I get in the car, grab the keys, and we're going off. And Linda says, don't you think we should pray? You know, ladies are often the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I turned it off, and we prayed. And we started an adventure that was going to go 20 months. It wasn't going to 8-5. It was going to go 20. Every day we said, Lord, help us to engage with the things we're not expecting. Help us to know how to respond to the people you bring into our lives. And we closed with that, thanking him for the opportunities. And that went on for 20 some months and it was a good time and then we were sitting in the doctor's office and one other doctor came in and says I just talked to Dr. Kovler we'd had some tests and he's going to come talk to you and I thought that's interesting and only and he said thank you for stopping by and the doctor came and he says well Linda you were in the hospital for a week we put the stint in it's not working we're going to have to do major surgery, but I know we've always talked this. You don't want major surgery. You're more about the quality than the quantity. And she said, yes. And he says, well, then I'll tell you, you're not, you can't eat anymore. He says, you may be able to drink water. We're not really sure about that. And I said, what does that mean? He said, well, that may mean 14 to 21 days. We went home. And if you were at the service in that picture with that little flower, she was sitting on there, and we were just praising God that he was still in control and thanking him. And that began 20-some days where uh, we were able to have people come over. They interacted. And, and then towards the end of that, maybe the 18th day, it was 21 days, so the 18th day, 
I talked to the girls and said, Mama seems to be slipping a little bit. I think we need to temper down some things. And they all agreed. And then it came to the 20th day, and it was my birthday. And I said, Lord, I wish you wouldn't die on my birthday. And then I said, Lord, maybe that's the best day because you know I don't remember dates. <laughs> and uh, I woke up the next morning. She was there. I got up. It was about 6 o'clock. I gave her, woke up the pills and gave it to her a little shot in the mouth because she couldn't swallow anymore. And, and then I went back down. And my, my normal, that was it. I'd give her her medicine, and I'd go down and spend time with the Lord and do my quiet time. And then I'd come back up about 8 o'clock. She'd be getting up and help her get up and stuff. So I came back about 8 o'clock, and the room was filled with my daughters and Maria, and all, just ladies. And I walked in, and I turned around and said, there's too much estrogen. And I'll come back, Linda. And I came back about 9 o'clock, and they had left, and I turned on, and we prayed, and we had our time together, and I, um, I turned on uh, the sound and for some hymns, because I, I, I tell people they're the best thing. Hymns can speak to your heart. And, so there, and I started, they were speaking to my heart, so I started singing. And I thought that was kind of funny. I said to Linda, I said, Linda, the girls aren't coming down the hall because I'm singing. You know what you think of my mind singing. And she smiled and went like this. And I uh, sang him another phrase, I think it was. And I looked up, and she was gone. God had taken her. Next two weeks were a blur. You know, when somebody dies, and then you got to take care of the body and the, and the funeral and the worship service and all. And we had a great time, and God spoke mightily at the service, and that was great. And about a week before all this happened, I was walking down the hall towards the room with Linda. And I said, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen when she dies. And Lord, always, not always, often speaks to me. And he spoke to me and he said, Mark, where have I been the last 20 months? I said, you've been right here and you've been doing all these things. And that's been a, it's been a blessing. It's been can we could say, Linda, Linda would say too, it was an exciting journey, those 20 months. It was so exciting the way God let us speak into people and people spoke into us. It was so exciting the way God put us together. Um, and he said, I've been here for 20 months. I'll be with you. Okay. I just, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm set. And we had the service. Two days later, I was in the darkest world I've ever been in for three weeks. The best way to describe it was I was in a sea that was raging, dark, cold, gray clouds, and nobody around. And every once in a while, I'd see a body, somebody floating by, and rather than seeing how they were doing, which is my normal tendency, I was just pushing them down. You know that you have, when you're drowning, what you do? You, you don't care who the person is, even if they're trying to save you, you're going to push them down. And I was pushing people down. And then I was writing little notes to God telling me, here, this is how we can fix all this. And I was sending them up, sending them up. And, and God was not responding. And, and all of us, in some degree, find ourselves in those things, don't we? You lose a job. Something happens in a marriage. Your children don't work out the way you hope they, and you find yourself in dark spots. And if you have to learn to walk with God in those dark spots, they get darker. If you have the right game plan, he'll see you through. And that's why I want to talk about a game plan. Because for three weeks, it was very, very dark for me. Turn with me to Psalm 13. We're just going to read the first two verses. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Okay. Is that 1101 back there? I am sorry, folks. With these temporary glasses, I can't see back there, and I haven't got a clock. Okay, we're in good shape then. David is praying to God, and God is not answering. How long will you forget me? 
he's going past that. He's saying, if you're the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God, the all-caring God, the all-loving God, and you're not answering, are you even there? Are you over somewhere else? Are you too busy to hear me? And he's crying out. And just like I was, I was crying out, where are you, God? You've been so close to me, now you're not here. If I can just see you face to face. You ever felt like sometimes all you need to do is see somebody face to face, you'll get it all fixed? And that's what he's saying. If I could just see God, I know we could get this squared around. And God says, I've got a bigger plan. You've got to wait on me. Waiting on God is a hard thing to do. David, David, a man after God's own heart, he's, he, he, he says, how can I do this? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? We're waiting on God, and we know how to fix it, don't we? And all God does has to do is what? Sign off on what we think will fix it. And God's not signing off on the way we want it to be fixed. And it's hard. And if you're not sure God's really there, if you haven't really been walking with God, it's even harder. And you know what? You'll start to try and fix it the wrong way. And we've all fixed things the wrong way, haven't we? And David is saying, Lord, answer me. My, in my heart, I just have sorrow. And how long is my enemy going to triumph? Everybody's watching. Satan's cheering. Good, good. Get him down. Stomp on him. Make him. He's been testifying to God. Make him really feel the pain. And people... Some people we know, we even, you know, even some people we work with, you, something happens bad with you, and they're just, they're, they're saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And that's the way the world is. And David is saying, that's how I feel. It's okay to feel dark and hurt. That's okay. That's feelings. Feelings come because of different things. It's what you let your feelings take you and where they take you that's wrong. You get angry, be angry and do what? Sin not. Don't take your anger out on other people because you're angry. Make other people feel bad. So, so David is feeling his feel and he's sharing it. And, and God doesn't mind. Don't ever be afraid to share with people how you're feeling because you're a Christian. You're not supposed to feel that way. Feelings are part of life. They're extremes. Pain, rejoice. Good, bad. There's extremes. Love, hate. They're just there. You have to be careful how you monitor them, what they're coming from, and why they're there, and then respond in a biblical way. If you have a good game plan, you'll respond in a biblical way. So David is saying, how long are they going to come? And then he says, then he says, I'm going to go from this dark time, because it's very dark, and I'm going to do what I normally do. David prays. So listen to him as he prays. He says, look on me and answer, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. The enemy will say I've overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I have fallen. And he's saying, God, answer me. My Jehovah, my Yahweh, Jehovah, the almighty God, you're the, I'm going to wait on you. You're the only one that can take care of this. And he's going before him. He's acknowledging, I know you're God. I know you're going to take care of me. You've got me in your hand. Every one of us that know Jesus knows where we are in Jesus', in Jesus hands. All the Father has given me, none of them have slipped through. I don't care where you're at. You're in God's hands. That's a good place to be. And then he says, give light to my eyes that I will not sleep in death. If you don't know, it's hard with the mic and the hand and everything. If you don't know what the word of God is and you don't have his light, you don't know how to respond. He said, you need to be spending time in God's word if you want to know how to respond to what's going to happen in your life. Otherwise, you're going to respond just like the world. You're going to respond like you did when you were a little baby. The more you know the word of God, the better you're going to have, the more light you're going to have to see what's going on and respond in the appropriate way. So he says, give light to my eyes. Thy word is a light unto my path. And so he's saying, give light to my eyes. And then when he says, 
My enemy will say, I've overcome him. My foe will rejoice. He says, if I don't know what to do from your word, I'm going to do it my way. Now, you know, sometimes we think our way is the best way. I read a statement. Well, it was a little card at a, a, a restaurant I was at uh, this week, and it said, are you worried? Are you anxious? Work hard. It's better than whiskey. Now, you know what? At first I thought, you know, that's a good statement. But no, it isn't. <laughs> no, it isn't. Listen, listen. If you're worried, what does the Bible say? Give, go to God. Pray without ceasing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything but prayer and supplication, let your request be in God. And the peace of God, that'll come in. See, you work hard, and it looks good, but it doesn't solve the, the worry. That worry's going to be there when you finish working. It, it, it placates it. And sometimes that's how we deal with problems. We, just, we have our game plan, but it's not God's game plan. And God is trying to change our game plan to be his game plan. Now, it could be the other tent city where down there, there are people feeling anxious and worried, and they're placating them with drugs and all sorts of other things. And, and there's good ways. And, and see, the world would say there's good ways and bad ways. God would say there's only one way, my way. And you and I, as we're walking through life, need to understand there's not other options. My option of my way may look better than some of the other people, but if it's not God's way, it's not right. It's not going to let the glory of the Lord come into my life, take away that pain, and let his light shine. And so you and I need to be asking ourselves, what is it, God, that you want to do? The only way you find that is you, you're spending time. Those three weeks, I was in this book every day, and I was praying every morning. And then God and I were on a walk, and it was a very dark walk. I was doing what I had to do. But I didn't know which way I was going. And I kept telling God. I kept throwing out things to him. And he kept not. Then one day, about maybe maybe 20, towards the end of the three weeks. And I don't know. I, I wrote down dates somewhere. I did my devotions. I was reading. I, I'm doing a reading schedule. And. And then I was praying again, and then I looked up, and I saw in my garden something needed to be done. And I just got up, and I went and did it. And the next thing I know, it was three hours. The next thing I know, I walked in, the girls, I think, I think God's cleared the air. And he had cleared away all that smoke, all that cold. I had to drive again to accomplish things. I was ready to be available. Now, looking back, I think what God was telling me and I, is I'm teaching you to float in my love. I'm a doer. I'm a swimmer. And I was trying to get out of that doing what I thought was the right thing, and I was going nowhere. And if you've ever learned to float, you know that they put you on the water, and, and you're scared to death, and they hold you up with their hands underneath you, and you're panicking, and all of a sudden... You're floating. You don't realize they pulled away your hands. And I think those three weeks, while I was wondering where God was, his hands were holding me, keeping me from making bad decisions. And he was saying, this isn't your job tomorrow. Your job is just to learn to rest in me. And I walked away from that. I said, okay, God, I know that you're not finished with me because I'm alive. But I also know maybe right now you just want me to rest in you. And, and so, so, so he says, then look at what happened. He says, but after he prays, look at the praise, but I have trusted in your unfailing love. He's saying, look, I'm praying. You're not answering. You haven't answered, but you're the one I'm trusting. So it could be three weeks, it could be 20. Don't ever do something because that's the way it worked in somebody else's life because God is working each one of our lives specially, individually. But you keep going to him because he's the only one that has the answers. He's God. 
You're willing to trust him with your salvation. You might as well trust him with your life. And he says, look what happens. He says, I have trusted in un your unfailing life. My heart is what? what? What is my heart doing? Rejoicing in your salvation. What was my heart doing in verse 2? My heart was sorrowful. When I saw the pain, my feelings were sorry, sorrowful. My heart was sorrowful. When I see God's hand and I can trust in his hand, my hand can rejoice in that because I know he's got a hold of me. When I can't see and I know he has my hand, I can rejoice. I can wait on it because he's God. He's all powerful. And I will sing. I'm not singing now, but I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. And the verb there is not just being good at this point or this point or this point. It's looking at the whole thing. He was good to me when he called me before the foundation of the world. He was good to me when he opened my eyes to Jesus Christ. He was good to me in my dark times. And he'll be good to me for eternity. And the game plan is a very simple one. It's pray and read your word. If you do that every day, and what you're doing, you're doing it for two reasons. One, you're asking God, what is it today you're going to bring my way? Open my eyes that I can see it and speak to it. And if God brings you your way, he's giving you what you need to say, and it maybe is, can I pray for you? I'm sorry for that. I did, we, Linda and I did that so many times in the elevator going up and down in cancer care. You could see it in people's eyes. I don't think one person said no. Um, and then you read the word because when you turn on the radio, when you look at newspapers, when you talk to people, you're going to get all sorts of news. And if you don't know the good news, their news can change the focus of your life. Or you can be saying, oh, that's bad. Let me tell you what God's doing in my life. Are you kind of discouraged? No, I'm not discouraged, but this is the reason why. I used to get, just like you, I used to get angry. But let me tell you what God's done. God has a game plan for each one of us so that we can move as David from being in a dark pit, feeling that God does not hear us or is not responding to the point we can rejoice and know that we're going to continue to walk with Jesus Christ. And God has been faithful, and I just want to tell you thank you because he's been very faithful to me. And I don't know what's going to happen. I just know I'm floating in his love, and he has been blessing me, and that's been exciting. We're going to pray. We're going to have a song, and then we're going to take communion. I wanted to save communion to the end because I want to say something about communion in light of Linda and my journey, okay? Well, I guess we're not going to have a song, so we will. Uh, uh, are we, what do you want to do? We're going to have a song. And that's good. Forgive me. I want, well, they're coming up. I'm going to show you something. See this? This picture? That's Linda. That's why I wore this. This is a picture, I think, about 2017. God so blessed me. Those 30 days, I have this picture also on my phone. Those 30 days, I could not look at that picture without having pain. Because I look at that picture and say, oh, what it used to be like. And I could not look at what tomorrow was going to be like. God now allows me to look at that picture and say, thank you, Lord, you blessed me, and look forward. Thank you, Lord, you're blessing me. I don't know all the blessings, but you're going to bless me. You are consistent. You are a loving and a caring God. Amen.